base it. Sure. And they're going to procure the, the things to build our lease and then bring them in. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. They should be releasing their... <laughs> call this regular workshop meeting of the Jacksonville City Council order. Uh, Council, you have before you a copy of the agenda for tonight's meeting, and I would adopt, I would entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. Second. Any discussion on favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? We also have uh, some consent items that are listed here, one through seven. Uh, and we have a set of uh, some minutes from the May 15th uh, special workshop, which there is an amendment. You should have a, a copy of the amendment at your place. The May 22nd regular workshop and the May 22nd, 2018 regular meeting. I entertain a motion to approve those. Move approval of the minutes and the consent items. Second. Discussion. Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you now, Dr. Woodruff, to introduce your first topic. Thank you, Mayor, members of the Council. Appreciate you being here tonight to continue our discussion with the budget for the coming year. When I first published the uh, list of things, Carmen said to me, uh, should we buy sleeping bags for them? <laughs> I said, yes, and we're probably going to also need some uh, late night desserts. <laughs> so hopefully this won't take uh, too much time, but obviously we're beginning to get down to the final numbers, and we're also beginning to get into June, and as we know, the budget must be adopted no later than June the 30th. What we'd like to do tonight is really get as much direction from you on these issues as possible. And what we'd like to do is go through the list which is shown. While it looks extensive, uh, Gail has promised me her part won't be that long, and I promise you my part will be that long. So maybe between the two of us we can, uh, can get through these items. You want these to be decision topics as we go? Or? If you feel comfortable, because at some point we do need to make these decisions. So when you look at the water and sewer rates, I would remind you that in the past we showed you four options. The first one we talked about is the just-in-time rate. Remember, you're looking at the third rate or the third column down or the third line, I should say, down combined rate. This first option shows that you would have no rate increases until 2021, and then you can see that the rates fluctuate and at a point in time they get to be pretty significant. And you'll recall that we showed you what option one looks like relative to the bills. You can see that under the first option, the bill in FY19 and in 20 is the same as the current bill. It begins to go up in FY21 and so forth. And when it gets out there towards the end in FY27 and 28, you can see it's pretty significant. You'll recall that the second option was basically an every other year rate increase, where you would have a rate increase in 19, one in 21, and so forth. And you can see again what the changes in rates would be under this section, under this second option every other year. This year it would go up to $55.50. It would stay that way for two years, then it would go up in 21, and so forth. The third option is simply a 1% increase annually, and you can see that that would continue out until 24, and then it would go up, and then it would fluctuate, and then a larger bill in 27, and you can see what the numbers actually look like. And then, of course, the fourth option was a 2.25% increase, and you can see that throughout the 10-year period, it would simply be an annual increase of the same amount. Now, whichever option you adopt, what you're doing is you're adopting a, what I'm going to call a theoretic model, but you're also adopting a one-year rate. Every year you have the right to look at the model and say, well, have things changed? And if so, you can change your decision or stay with your decision. So here again are the rates. You can see that under this arrangement, the bill would go up and under the uh, uh, FY19, it would go up roughly $1.21 from the current year. So the question before you is, Council, we've shown you a lot. 
There are a lot of pros and cons for each option, and we're just simply asking you tonight, if you're ready, to give us some direction. Otherwise, tell us what else you'd like for us to study, and then at a future date, tell us what your thoughts are. Council? Well, I lean towards the, uh, the two and a quarter. At least, uh, the, and my my argument there is, um, it's it's a small amount each year, um, and we're as you said, we're in theory, we're we're looking at potential more, but we're talking about just this next year. But when I look out to the to the future, to the last year that the model does, um, it's it gives the lowest overall cost, at on a monthly basis at that, for those last years and I I just think that a smaller increase uh, and a more and a steady increase rather than uh, up and down a, a smoother increase I think is is perhaps a little more palatable to me and I hope hope to our ratepayers so I would uh, I lean that way is that a motion yes I'll second Okay, you have a motion and a second. Is there a discussion? I, I was leaning toward number three because it was a lower increase and it was a give us a chance to, let's just say, digest this model. I can't quite put myself in a position where I'm confident that somebody can tell me what's going to be the situation 10 years from now. That's uh, a long ways out. Now, if we had time and you could take this model back to 2007 and plug in everything we had then, and it could tell us, hit the mark on 2017, and tell me for sure this is where we were and where we needed to be, then I'd be more confident. But with the, <clears throat> with the inputs that have been put in at this point, as far as the growth projections, maybe they're accurate. Maybe there, you know, maybe time will prove them out. But I mean, I'd like a chance to look at more scenarios of, say, you know, this was near just low, low growth. I mean, maybe look at a modest growth. Look at, you know, but say if, just take for instance, take the growth we've had in the past 10 years and say project it for, you know, ahead for 10. Take what we've had in the past five years project it for 10. You know, see what those do to the model. Um, again, I just, I, well, I mean, we can spend our way into an increase any time we want to. Sure. You know, we've got projects on the books that are designed for one scenario, but yet we're, you know, we're actually projecting another scenario. So with the state of the fund at this time, I'm just not ready to to go two and a half. Well, well, four we're, years. You know, we're we're only doing this year. We're not binding next year or the year after the year after. We're only binding. We can only bind ourselves for what for this current budget year. So we're not really binding anything for the future. We're just saying that. You know, at this point, it appears that a two and a quarter percent is the way to go. Next year, that may not be true. But like you said, it's going to be reevaluated every year. This model, mm -hmm. right? To update it, and yes, sir. You even with certain changes to it, even with the two and a quarter percent, then I I agree we can always reevaluate this year after year. But two and a quarter is probably, in my mind, just we're probably holding even with the increased cost of electrical power and a cost of living increase it's a it's a very modest increase i think in view of all the circumstances if i had life to live over again i'd go back those years that we didn't raise the health insurance and we spent our reserve our reserves on down i wish that i that i had voted to do a modest increase along to keep the reserves at least slow it down and and for the future and have a chance that we could stabilize that so i think that's maybe i maybe that's making me lean this way but i'd rather i'd rather i'd rather want i want to hold on to our reserve if we can or at least 
spend it down slowly. I don't want to just hold it forever. I, I think it needs to be spent, but I'd better spend it down slowly than quickly. Very good points. Any other discussion? No, I read it at um, 2.25. I agree with that as well. I'd rather have a – because we can hold it next year if we have to, which instead of, you know, having to catch up on the other end, I'd rather make it a gradual increase. I think cost of doing business is going up and not going down, so more than likely we're going to have to see some kind of increase in the future anyway. So. We do. You know, we, we know that this is a new model. We know right. our folks aren't experienced with it yet, perhaps, and they're going to learn some things. And But I think this is a good conservative approach for, for the – for the for the immediate future, not maybe not down the road, but for the immediate future. Any other comments, discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? No. Okay. Yeah, it's, um, Thank you, uh, Mr. Warden. I was a little concerned there when you said if you had to live your life over. I thought you were going to say you would have gone to UNC. No, he I, did. I, he I, did. I, I, Don't worry. I, I mean, I know you're wearing Duke colors today, but uh, okay. That's not one of my regrets. No. Okay. <laughs> did you get the vote on that? Yes, I did. The next is authorized positions. And we explained this a little bit in the memo which you received on Thursday. These are the full-time, benefited part-time, and non-benefited part-time positions. You will notice that the full-time went up by one. We discussed with you the transportation position. We've already signed contracts that are going to bring in revenue for that. Let's talk a second about the non-benefited part-time. When you look at that from 63 to 78, first thing you say is, wow. Well, let's talk about what that is. These are 15 new non-benefited part-time positions, but they're not actually new positions. These are positions we have traditionally hired through the temp agency. What I have found since our last discussion last budget <clears throat> year is that in order for us to put someone on the city's payroll, you have to authorize a position. So even though the money has been in the budget under temporary <laughs> positions, because we didn't have authorized positions, we still had to hire those through the temp agency. So as you can see, this is nothing but the three E's at work. What we're asking is no additional money, it's not going to cost us any more money at all. Actually, it will save us money because, remember, we pay the temp agencies a 35% or 32% premium for handling it. What this does, though, is it gives us positions so we can write a check. That's all this is. So in the end, whoops, in the end, what you're going to have, go back one, is instead of 63 part-time non-benefited positions, you're going to have 78. So what does that actually mean? When we have lifeguards this summer, if we don't have a budgeted position, we can't write a check. Therefore, we can't hire them. So what we do is go to the temp agency. So by doing this, we will now have 15 what we call pool positions. No, no pun intended with swimming pool but there'll be pool positions. Some times of the year, some of those will be filled by lifeguards. Other times of the year, some may be filled with uh, grass cutters. But what we need in order to write a check is budgeted positions because the auditors have numbers. You know, we give them the numbers that are approved and they look and see, okay, how did you get that person on the payroll when you don't have an authorized position. So this is really what I'll call a housekeeping issue so that we can get back and implement what we talked with you a year ago about. Again, it doesn't, it's not an issue of money. It's an issue of process so that we can directly hire these people. How many, as it is, how many temp positions do you usually keep up, uh, have at any one time? Well, during the baseball season, uh, you know, Susan, uh, I'll get you the, the actual answer because I don't know that answer, but I can give you an example. 
when we have uh, a baseball program going on, you'll have people running con concession stand, people running the scorebook, people who are the referees. So depending, you could have in one game, if you had four games going on at the same time, you could wind up with, who knows, 12 or 15 people. Some of those were going to continue to hire through the temp agency because what we find is that uh, somebody will keep score and then they'll say, yeah, this isn't for me. So two days later, they're gone. What we're talking about with these 15 positions, though, they are the people who, who we know have stayed with us the longest. For example, the lifeguards last year. We started Memorial Day. The same three lifeguards stayed with us all the way through until Labor Day. But we hired them through the temp agency. This year, we want to hire them through the city. And we've actually worked some vacant <coughs> positions and actually taken those vacant positions that are really full-time rather than part-time so that we can write that person a check. So that's really what this is, is to allow us to be the ones who are hiring so we can give them a check. So you say they are temporary, so it's not like somebody works 12 hours a week, 52 weeks a year. No. It's, they're just By law, they, they cannot work more than 1,000 hours, which is almost, you know, the, the typical work year is 2,080 hours. So by law, they can't work more than 1,000 hours or they kick into certain retirements and those type things. These are all short-term jobs. Do you have exposure on unemployment? Oh, yes. That kind yeah. of stuff. So you, you still have exposure on unemployment. So you could hire them for six months and they could be un get unemployed. And you have unemployment. exposure on workers' comp. Right, you know, right. That's why the, uh, the yeah. temp agency is charging to, yeah. to cover and, that. And I wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't suggesting that the temp agency is making a tremendous right. amount of money. You know, for people like grass cutters, we really want them through the temp agency because there's a tremendous turnover, and you do have liability, and here's workers' comp. So there are positions we would not want to hire through this. Mm -hmm. So you're right. We don't want to move away totally from the temp agencies. Mm -hmm. But this request is to allow us to have 15 non-benefited part-time positions, no extra cost in the budget. I think actually the unemployment may not be so much of an exposure, because I think HR is having them sign something when they come on board that says you're hired from May 1st to June 30th, or and this is your time. Mm -hmm. And I think that limits the exposure, doesn't it? It does. It's okay. a term of employment. I see. So we, we agree up front that they're here for two weeks, weeks, three weeks a month. Mm -hmm. And they sign that. Thank you. So you need authorization to Please. increase the number of authorized positions 15, by 15, 15 for, for the part time part okay. positions. I'll motion. make that motion. I'll second it. Okay. Any other discussion? <clears throat> All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? General fund balance. As you know, the general fund balance is basically our savings account. The part that you really focus on is the cash. That's the unrestricted, or I suppose the accounting term is now unassigned, or you also use unrestricted. Oh, we change it every few years just to keep everybody interested. <laughs> okay. This is not your total fund balance because you have restricted funds as well as the unrestricted or unassigned. <coughs> what you can see is that in 2012, 2013, and so forth, we went through some lean years. Y'all have, y'all, that's not correct. The city council has a policy that we try to follow. It's not in writing, but you have told us that you want us to make sure, if at all possible, we have somewhere in the vicinity of $10 million in the unrestricted that way in case we have a major disaster or something happens. So this is the current status of your unassigned or unrestricted fund balance. It does not show 2018 because those numbers are not yet audited, but these are the audited numbers. Want to comment on this? 
are now okay. You're good. So far, I haven't made any mistakes. I thought our policy was rather than a dollar amount, it was a percentage. Percentage. It's something is. like ten to fifteen percent. It is. Well, when you work when you work out the general fund budget of forty eight million dollars, and then you say ten <laughs> to fifteen percent, you begin to get up into okay. I, you know, I like closer to 20%. That's where you get the 10 million. But you are correct, sir. It's it's a percent. This is what you've actually spent from time to time. We balance our budget every year on fund balance. What you can see is in the used column. In 2012, we budgeted 4 million. We actually used 100,000. In the next year, we budgeted, but we actually put money back in the fund balance added to it. In 14, we used a lot. Although we budgeted a lot, we used about a million. And this 17 year, we budgeted 2 million. We actually wound up adding 4 million to the fund balance. What that tells you is that we are fiscally conservative. We don't waste money. It doesn't mean that you have money to throw at problems, but what it does mean is we are sound. The base budget, you have already approved certain things in the base budget. The base budget that was presented to you, and I rounded the numbers off, it's actually 698,000 and change or whatever. The base budget is balanced at 700,000 coming out of your savings account. The health premiums, which you spoke of a minute ago, you've now already approved taking another 155000 And the miscellaneous department items that we discussed, which you have approved, took another 43 and change. So out of your base, uh, for your budget approval so far, the fund reserve is going to provide roughly $900,000. That's really a status check so that as we get into the next series of discussions, you'll understand that you've already agreed that out of the number back here of $17 million, that you're going to spend a million of that already. Now, let's look going forward. We haven't determined anything regarding general compensation, and we haven't determined whether you're going to support the police scale or not. The numbers that I gave to you before were my math. As you know, you like Gail's math better than mine. So before tonight, Gail finalized all of the numbers for the, for the police scale. My numbers were generally in the 450, 460,000. Obviously, I was off. So the actual number that she has calculated is 5 million, I'm sorry, $511,000. We also have two other items that we need to discuss at a point, and that's street paving and tax rates. And we will be discussing those towards the end of the uh, presentation tonight, and I think you're going to be pleased with some of the information you're going to get. Let's talk about compensation. I appreciate the work that Kimberly and the staff did relative to educating you on a whole series of comparables, the North Carolina League of Municipalities, and so forth. I feel like that we just need to get it down as simple as possible. So here's what I'd like to discuss with you tonight. I want to show you my recommendations of what markets we compete with, how we should place our positions in each market, what is cost of living and scale movement about, wage adjustment fund, and police pay. When it comes to markets, I think you would agree with me, we have 556 employees, but they are about as varied as you can come. There are people, and this is why I've come up with three markets. A lot of our jobs, probably over 250, maybe even 300 of our jobs, it's just local. We're competing with the auto parts store across the street. We're competing with the construction company up the road. We're competing with the retail centers. They are local. When you look at a lot of our jobs, 
Most of them come, the employees come from Onslow County. Some will drive from Carteret, Jones, Pender, Craven, but they don't drive or move <coughs> here for most of our jobs from Asheville or Charlotte. They're, it's a local market. The second group, which you'll see in a minute, is what I'm going to call the regional market. That's the local market plus eastern North Carolina. You might have somebody move here from Greenville for some of these jobs that are going to be considered regional jobs. You might have somebody move here from Fayetteville for a regional job. But even in the regional jobs, nobody's going to move here from Asheville or from Atlanta unless they're unemployed and need a job. And then, of course, you have national, which includes local, regional, and national. And those would be jobs such as when you get tired of me and you're looking for a new city manager, you go out and find somebody on the national level. By the way, y'all didn't have to smile so quickly. <laughs> so here are the benchmark jobs. I don't expect you to read them all, but you can pick up a couple. Let's color code it real quickly. The light blue, those are local jobs. Look at the list. Custodial worker, maintenance worker, meter, re meter reader, sanitation worker, and so forth. Every one of those you can see, and I think you would agree, those are people that we're going to hire at a local market. Again, they are not, we're not competing with Fayetteville for that person. We might be competing with Onslow County or Onwasa or the school board. So in this concept, you can see who I think will be hiring locally. The second part in green, you will see at the top of the second column, accounts payable specialist. There it's blue and green. Why? Because there are going to be some local people applying and there'll be some regional people. So for an accounts payable specialist in Gale's area, of course, we know Gale is so wonderful to work with that people would move here from where? Miami or Hawaii. <laughs> but setting that aside, we're going to have a larger pool of people. And then, of course, you can get over on the right-hand side and you can see things like the chief information officer or the finance director. That's going to be probably a much larger search. Maybe they're going to be local. Maybe they're going to be regional. Maybe they're going to be national. What I'm asking you to agree to in this recommendation is, go back, that you agree that we don't have one market we're looking at. We're not, we're not worried about looking at the scales of everybody on the North Carolina League of Municipalities. Because not every job do we compete with everybody on the North Carolina League of Municipalities. What I'm asking you is to agree that we really divide the workforce up into local, regional, and a national market. And again, just as an example, this isn't all of our positions, but what we would do as a staff is then we would place each job in the city in one of those three markets. So if you're looking for a maintenance worker, we really look at the local market and try to figure out what does the local market pay for it not what does the average on the North Carolina League of Municipalities pay for it. That's the concept. I think that's my last comment on that. Any thoughts? Do you like the approach? Do you think it's not scientific enough? You want us to go back and do something different? Uh, what are your thoughts? What are your other thoughts? <laughs> I thought we've always had a had a group, as you said. Uh, some things are local. You know, we're we don't need to be comparing a, uh, a a janitor in High Point to a janitor here. We're we're competing against the base or or on Wassa or or school systems, whatever for the janitors, and and I'm a custodial, and and I I've always thought we had a, a hybrid thing, and I didn't. I like the idea of going out to other municipalities. But I don't want that to be, because it's easy, I don't want that to be the road taken. I think this is a little tougher to, to do, but I think it's the right approach. I think, I think we do have tiers or areas that, that, um, that we compete in, and, and you just can't take a one-size-fits-all. 
Well, aside from it being a, a logical schematic, uh, the practical purpose is what? Just for uh, setting forth your recruiting base? It's actually twofold. It's to set forth the parameters that we look for when we try to determine as a person properly compensated. And it's okay. to make sure that we are having starting salaries that are realistic for this area, not a starting salary that is based upon what Asheville or Charlotte or somebody. I mean, the, the main thing here is to give us parameters so that we understand that when we're looking, let's say again, for the accounts payable, yes, we are going to look at what the region pays. But when we're looking for a admin one, we're just looking at what the local people pay, not what they pay in, again, you know, Asheville or Fayetteville, because those are not the people that we are competing with. I like, I like what I say there. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. Based on a hybrid, is the cost of living in this area considered in that process and the you know and that just based on the, the other um people people we're competing with All right. to figure i that would out. say indirectly <laughs> it is addressed but not directly but what we also know is every region of north carolina there's a different cost of living i mean yeah, i was uh, <clears throat> my wife enjoys looking at uh, home magazines and the cost of a house on Emerald Isle is a little <laughs> bit higher than the typical cost of a house in Jacksonville. But I will also say to you, most of the people who actually work in retail in Emerald Isle are paid about the same as in Jacksonville because most of them don't actually live in Emerald Isle. So cost of living is a factor, but it would be an indirect, indirect factor. So do you like the concept or not? Yes, yeah, fine. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Let's talk about the scale. Remember, we have 35 wage grades. Every grade has an entry level and a maximum pay, and that's called the scale. Mm -hmm. Now, as we've talked to you in the past about some of our recruiting issues, and in the police department specifically, we have mentioned to you that our entry salary does not automatically move when council gives cost of living adjustments. You saw a chart in one of the budget note follow-ups that over the last six or seven years, we've only moved the scale twice. And one of the results of that is the entry level has stayed where it was. It didn't move. Others, such as the Sheriff's Department, they have moved their entry levels. So this is the current policy of the city is this. Unless you say every budget that the scale will move X percent, it doesn't move. What I'm asking you to do is reverse that so it says the following, adopt the policy that each year the wage scales will move one half the cost of living approved by council. For example, if the council gives a 2% cost of living, then the scale will move 1%. Why is it you don't want it to move the same amount? You'll never have a spread because the person who got hired this year and gets a 2% increase, if you move the scale 2%, then the person who's hiring tomorrow is going to be making the same pay as the person who hired a year ago. So the purpose here is to gradually move the ships apart. So the concept would be that until you reverse this policy, every year, the budget document would write, you would have authorized Gail to write into the budget document that the wage scale will move one half whatever the cost of living is. Now, if you give no cost of living, the scales don't move. 
If you give a 1%, the scale moves a half a percent. If you give a dollar figure like $1,000, which you did once, then the scales would move $500. Whatever you give as a compensation adjustment, then the scale would move one half of that. And of course, any budget, you can reverse that. But right now, it's by default the other way. And that's, I think, why we've gotten a little bit behind on some of our issues. This makes it where you have to consciously veto the scale moving. What are your thoughts? How easy will it be to identify what the the scale cost is? Yeah, there's a I mean, cost. That's, you know, yeah. you know, it's kind of you know we know there. we know if we give a one percent increase, we know what the impact on the budget. But now we're saying there's also a half a percent scale increase. What does that impact on the budget? Because it's going to affect this year, and of course from then on. So there is an impact. There is. The, the mm -hmm. nice thing about the entry level salary is what? Unless you're adding employees, the person who's being hired is filling a position that you already budgeted at a higher cost. So for example, if a police officer was at $40,000 and they left us, we hired the new police officer at whatever it is, pick a number, $34,000. So there is a realistic cost, but it doesn't actually increase your budget. It actually reduces your salary savings due to vacancy. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Now, I don't know that we can actually compute that, but what we can do is, is show you uh, some examples based upon, uh, let's say, we can look at vacancies the last uh, 90 days maybe the first quarter of this fiscal year, and say, here are the vacancies, here's what that person was being paid. When we hired the new person, here's what they got paid. I mean, that data, but you see what I'm saying is that it's not. you're always hiring a person at a lower salary than the person who just left. But it's still a cost. It's still a cost. It's still a cost. Yeah. Now, if I'm understanding, you're not just talking about moving the entry, but you're talking about every step that you would have in that scale would go up. Well, the, I, I have uh, whatever whatever the scale is, a well, half of the cola. That's correct. I mean, the right. whole if, the, if whole. the entry level is at thirty and the top is at fifty, then everything in shifts. that mm -hmm. shifts. Mm -hmm. And that's how you avoid the compression problem. Correct. <clears throat> Which is costing us a lot of people. What are your thoughts? <clears throat> well, if you take, I'm a little confused on this. If someone is at step five. Well, uh, hold on a second. Okay. There's no such the, thing. There is no such thing as the, you know, let me start that differently. The police step plan, if you adopt it, this doesn't apply to it. We're only talking about the current program that we have which doesn't have any steps in it. Oh, okay. The current program, and I'll give a bad example, is <clears throat> the current program is if I'm hired as uh, a maintenance worker and I'm paid thirty-five thousand dollars, there are no steps. Okay. So the only way my, my salary question. moves yeah. forward is if you give a cost oh, of living. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So if you go five years with no cost of living, I'm still making thirty-five thousand so, dollars. So there really is no scale in that one. All you have is an entry level. Is that correct? And, and a max. And, and a max. And a max. So for oh, example, right. okay. but on the police, it would make a difference. If you adopt the police scale, this doesn't apply, mm -hmm. because what we're actually talking about is if you okay. on the police program is setting up two different compensation plans, one for all the rest of the employees and the step plan for the police. So this would not apply to police at all. But you would have a step plan for the police. You would have a step plan for the police, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. And if we move this way, there's a possibility in the future to put everyone on a step plan. You can do anything. You know, all, all it takes is uh, you all to vote and tell us what to do. <coughs> you could put everybody. I have seen, uh, in not in the private sector, but I have seen uh, documents, and Kimberly certainly has with her experience, where in, especially in union states, where every employee mm -hmm. 
other than management, is on a step plan right. with guaranteed increases. Mm -hmm. Now, we're not suggesting that here. This applies to your current pay plan, not if you, it does not include police if you put them on a, on a step plan. Okay. And mm -hmm. We had a discussion before that, that if we gave a cost of living and somebody was already maxed out, they don't, they don't really participate in that cost of living. Is that correct? What they get is a bonus check, but right. it does not move their salary. Right. So if my, if my salary is capped at 40000 mm -hmm. and I get a 1% bonus or 1% COLA, I get that in a check, but okay. my salary okay. is still 40000 Okay, so we're spending the money. The, employee, the, the employees are not at max, get it spread out every year. Employees are at max, he gets a one time. Correct. I like, I like the idea of the concept there with the uh, general employee. You want to think on this one a little more? Well, you know, I, I, I like the fact that we're addressing the wage scales. I guess I, that's something that I'd never considered before, that we, that we weren't moving the wage scale. But I, what I don't, what I'm uncomfortable with is what is the impact? What's the financial impact of this? We'll see if we can quantify I know, And I know that's a tough one. I know, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty nebulous, uh, you know, the impact. But, but somehow, you, you know, I mean, you could spend hours Try, figuring it out and trying to get it down to a NATS, but I'm just wondering what it, what it, what it uh, potential impact is. Let us look, and what we can do is go back and give you, uh, we'll look at the first quarter of this year as to the turnover mm -hmm. and show you what was the person who left. We won't give you names, obviously, but we will give you, pick a number. If there were 10 positions that left, what were they making? When the person was hired, what were they making? Well, you know, but yeah, the the problem with that is, though, you know, we 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 use fund balance to to balance the the budget, and we know that we've got certain things that happen that that um, that we save on, and one of them obviously is employee turnover. If we hire somebody in an entry level and so forth, we understand that, and so you know, there is an impact on what's happening to that fund balance. We either you know, spend spend more or spend some of the savings or whatever. That's really what I'm looking for, not not necessarily what you're actually saving off of somebody leaving, but what is the impact of doing this? What, you know, how much are we giving up or? or yeah, and we can cover that by doing this. Okay. We'll show you what was the person being paid under the current system, what was the new person paid? And we'll just say, Let's assume that that entry moved up 1%. Then what would that salary have been? And that will tell you that it cost you, pick a number, $1,000. Yeah. And, you know, it's easy for me to come up with these things because Gail actually does all the work. <laughs> so between the two of us, we will, we will come up with uh, some think data. Between the HR and finance. It's pretty difficult to quantify. Boy, so you darn right it's it is. It's like a I moving just, target. I'm, boy, I'm yeah, not sure that it's the cost of doing business. I think try to do the best you can to give us uh, some idea yeah. of the impact. Uh, like I said, I don't, I don't think it would be much. It, has, it would probably be very marginal. Well, let's see what we can <coughs> come up with. That's, that's Do what we're... Dr. Woodruff, yes, in your research, if possible, can we see um, what a step salary would look like Cons um, with a municipality close to the city of Jacksonville that has implemented um, step salary for their employees. Not a bad idea. And make a comparison. We will see what we can get. That that will be a, a comparison be, of what? Well, you're on. You'll when you go to the next uh, subject, you'll see a little bit how that works. Correct. On the police pay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a problem with steps. Just. You know, just they, they reward you for staying on the job. That's no, all no, it no. is. It's not, not all. No, 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 that's not true. That is not true. I, well, I, was, I beg well, to differ. Did. That I was, is not true. I was true. civil service for that a federal civil service true. for ten years. That is not true. I beg to differ. I beg to differ. That is not true. Okay. Well, explain when we go over it. You can give an explanation as to what it takes to move from one step to the next. It's it's a little bit more involved than. 
what now, we think. The next thought has to do with a proposed cost of living increase. The adjusted CPI for this region is 1.8 percent. Now that's based upon the the published number as of December 31, 2017. Bear with me because I'm going to give you really an odd concept that so that before you overreact or, or just give me a moment. <clears throat> What I'm proposing is that across the board, now this assumes that you're not going to do the police pay plan. I'm not saying you shouldn't, that's a different discussion. But if we don't have a police step plan, then the cost of living would be one and a half percent for every employee across the board, all 556 employees. The cost is shown there, roughly 334000 for the general fund, water and sewer at 55000 others at 55000 In addition to that, you saw last week when Kimberly and, and the group did their presentation, we do have some compression and wage inequities. They are complicated, and we can't figure all of that stuff out in time to adopt the budget. So here's what I'm suggesting. You also approve a wage adjustment fund of $300,000 out of the general fund, $20,000 out of water and sewer, and twenty five dollars out of the other. Why are those numbers lower? Because there are fewer employees in it. And what you do is you let the manager work on this under these guidelines and determine where the real compression issues are. I'll be the first to tell you that I don't believe every city employee is underpaid. I just don't believe that. I want, since we're on the air and I don't want to hurt any employees' feelings, I will tell you there are departments and people within departments that if they get a 1.5% pay increase this year, I think you've taken good care of them. There are other people that because of their uh, scales not moving and so forth, that we have compression. And that they should, some of them should receive, pick a number, a higher than one and a half percent. The guidelines would be that it wouldn't just be me doing the work, obviously, but Gail and Kimberly and uh, the senior staff will work with the department heads. We'll look at compression issues. We'll look at hiring issues. We'll look at years in grade, the market, whether it's local and so forth. And we will then determine whether the people in this department all get X or does a third of them get this amount and a third of them get a lesser amount and so I'm getting none amount. I mean, once again, and, and Kerry's sitting here, so I don't think he'll mind me using him as an example. In the sanitation department, we're now having real trouble with the entry-level jobs. If we need to increase that, pick a number, by 4 or 5%, that doesn't mean that all 38 people in his department need a 5% increase. It means that some of them at the earlier levels where we have compression may need some adjustments and some of the people who are further out may not need adjustments or vice versa. So what I'm trying to do is provide money that will address some of the issues we have in our pay plan. But this is not one where, in my opinion, one size fits all. You can't say that you can cure all of your wage issues by giving everybody a 4% pay increase. All that does is move the same problems just 4% higher. So this concept would be expensive, but what it would do, going back, is it would say, for everybody, 1.5%—you'll set aside an additional 300,000 of general fund and 45,000 of other funds that the manager will work within these guidelines, and that by October 1st, you would be implementing this. Now, 
I know that's that's a, an odd approach. So you you're rolling up the two the two issues the the market market changes and so forth, and then in, into this as well as a one and a half percent cost of living across yes. the board. And what I would say to you is there are, in my opinion, there are a number of city employees who the only thing they'll wind up with is the one and a half percent cost of living increase. Because again, I see the pay of every employee. I see what they do. I know how they're compensated. I know how they're compensated versus their peers in the same group. I know how they're compensated between departments. And I can say to you, we have some people that I believe are underpaid. I can also tell you we have people who I don't think are underpaid. And that's why a, pick a number, a 4% adjustment for everybody simply doesn't cure anything. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't address the wage issues that some of our employees face. And I will also say to you, most of this money is going to go to our lower paid employees. Think about that. I hope it's not a nightmare, but think about it. Now, let's talk about the police compensation. Adopt the pay plan, implement it July 1, it replaces cost of living completely for anybody who's in the plan. Let's look at the plan again. You've seen agencies that do it. I'd refresh your memory. Currently at the bottom, you can see the current range is 34.8 to 55.7. No. Here's what's going to happen. You get capped. We do not want a department, a police department, made of PO1s. So in this plan, you would start off at 38,000, which isn't as high as the Sheriff's Department, but it's certainly a lot higher than where we are today. We believe this will address some of your turnover issues. There'll always be turnover in any department because people are married, their spouse moves on, something happens, they decide that this really isn't like TV policing, it's the real world. So in this, you would have guarantees you would not have a cost of living. Start off at 38, move to 38.5, and so forth. Come the fifth year, if you haven't advanced, as the chief has explained, the certifications they have to get, if you haven't advanced, then you're capped at $40,000. And all you'll get is a bonus but it won't stick with you. The difference between a bonus and a pay increase is what? A pay increase stays with you forever. A bonus is, here's a one-time check. So let's say for discussion purposes, I'm at 40,000 and I haven't qualified to become a PO2. My pay is gonna be 40,000 and let's say I get a $500 bonus. Next year, my pay is what? 40,500? 40, no. no. It's 40000 And if we don't give out bonuses, they get nothing. If we give out a $500 bonus, they get $500. So again, this program is designed, if you pardon the bluntness, to force people to move to be the police certifications we want them to be. Mike will tell you, he doesn't want a police department made up of PO1s. The next level is the PO2s. And you can see that these steps are $1,000 a piece. But again, after four years, when you reach the fifth year, if you're not ready to be a corporal, you're capped. You can be a, corp you can be a PO2 forever, but until council comes back and changes these scales, you're going to be at 46000 You will get a bonus if one is given. And then, of course, with the corporals, which is, and I think Mike would agree, you, I know the mayor, I think he would agree, you want your police department made up of the P3s, which are corporals. These are the people who have eight to 10 years experience. They're mature. They have proven themselves. They are the backbone of your department. You don't want to lose these people. And of course, you can see the steps. Here's the difference between this step and the previous two. 
we can't continue to have steps to year five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So what would happen here is that in year four, you would have a guaranteed step. In year five, whatever cost of living council gives, that would go to your base salary. You don't get a bonus. So for example, if you're at 51,000 and you get a 1% cost of living increase, your salary actually went to $51,510. Let's assume my math is right. That would, that's how that would move up. Now, you also would need to adjust. We're not putting sergeants and lieutenants on a scale, but because you potentially would have corporals at 51,000, you'll have to change the entry level for the sergeants from 44.5 to 52. You'll have to change the lieutenants from 49 to 58. And it, it, there is a cost to the plan. Now, as I said before, Gail has proofed these numbers now. Actually, she told me she was no longer going to let me do math in private, much less in public. So the cost to implement this plan is a half million dollars. The key, though, is once you implement this plan, the annual maintenance cost is roughly $87,000. And that compares to roughly a 2% cost of living increase uh, that you're going to give 2% each year. So you are talking a significant investment. On the other hand, I'd remind you, every time a police officer walks out of here, we've lost thirty-five to $50,000 in, in investment. And I asked Mike this morning, I showed him these numbers, and I will ask him to come up to the table. Would you mind sitting next? You can sit where Michael is there, I just don't make any pizzas. Uh, I'd like to ask him, do you, do you support this plan, and do you believe it will address some of your turnover? I think it will. Like I've I said before, in the in the times that I've seen it with in other agencies, where they had step plans in different parts, as I've done assessments, most of the, most of the agencies that have a step plan have very low turnover. So I think uh, I think this is one step that we can use to to at least retain the the folks that were that were training. Yes, sir. How does this improve our competitive position with the Sheriff's Department or Holly Ridge or, for example, is it we're not matching the starting salary, but is it a point where we want these officers to move quickly from PO1 to PO2 and then we become competitive at that level? Or? You become competitive at the two and, and corporal, at the PO2 and the corporal level. Okay. We believe it will reduce people you know, people may still move for $1,000, but right now they're moving for five and $6,000. And you might have some entry level that might move from 38 to 40, which is what the starting salary is for the sheriff. But the folks that, we've, that we have significant investments in, um, I think this will address some of that concern about uh, going from one agency to another. Dr. Woodruff, I have a clarification. Well. I need clarification just to make sure I'm understanding this with the scale. So say, for instance, we have a brand new PO1 who is starting off at 38000 and by year three, he or she has required all of their certification. So with having three years in the city, they are now ready to move to PO2, correct? So will their starting salary begin at the 42 or would it begin at year three, the 45, because they have three years already invested in the city? It would begin at 42. And what they would okay. do is they would jump, and let's use your three-year number, they would jump from 39.5 to 42,000. And the reason why is because if you jumped from year three to year three, you would suddenly have a, a tremendous cost that we haven't factored in, and it would cause compression within the, the P2s and P3s. I mean, there has to be what I'll call a chronology or a timeline that you go through. Where you do jump in salary, 
is if you are really interested in getting all your certifications and you get them as quickly as possible, you don't have to go year one, two, three, four, and five before you get to the next step, year one, two, three, four, five before you get to the next step. I mean, I think, Mike, you have said before that the minimum time a person is a P1 before they can become a P2 is how many years? Well, it depends. It depends on your education. So, so like a P01, which is the scenario that, that you just brought up, could happen very easily if that person has a degree. So that degree cuts down the number of, of experience and the number of points they have to have because it's based on experience, points, and education. So, so the, it, depending on, on the officer, if an officer comes from another department, he might be able to move up quicker in our organization if he has those training points and his, his associate or bachelor's or master's degree. And if he or she does not? How what? friendly is the system to allow them to move very quickly, or there, or are there barriers that would impede that process for that person? You know, we've been, uh, and of course, the mayor can speak to that a little bit about uh, about the programs that we've implemented with the community college. Uh, so if somebody can get their degree. We have the cops program, which is all online, that allows an officer to take advantage of his BLET plus uh, take take classes online. And then they have an articulation agreement with Western Carolina that allows them to get their bachelor's degree the same way, all online. Also, they can work uh, work um, the shift work and not be. And then, of course, we, we do allow officers while they're on duty, if they have a class, a particular class, to attend while they're on duty, uh, given our, our current workload. Yeah, so, so much and uh, we still have that. Do they have opportunity? Yeah, we have the tuition reimbursement. I was well. about to say that. Yeah. Is is that is that going very well, or is there a list for you to be approved in that process? Kimberly, you managed that. What's the answer? Right. So um, there is no waiting list. Everyone that applies, it, it gets the benefit at this point. We haven't had an abundance, um, so everyone that's interested has been able to be pushed through. Is that open to council? I'm just joking. <laughs> no, I'm we not. Is <laughs> we have a lot of we've had a lot of officers take advantage of the cops program, and in fact, uh, one of the things that we're going to do through our roll call is try to encourage that again. Something okay. Yes, because we did that a couple years ago. We got a lot of interest, and then um, we've got a lot of new officers, so we're trying to encourage them to use that. And the BLAT uh, gives them about a semester of. Of work, and then we have some articulation agreements also with um, the Justice Academy. If they take uh, uh, report writing, it counts as English. If they take um, uh, advanced traffic investigation, which has a lot of math, it counts towards their math. So there's there's a lot of ways that they can do that. Would you, uh, for their information, would you explain how they accumulate training points towards their certification? Yeah. So a training point, one training point is worth. Um, is worth four hours of training. So um, if they have 40 hours, they get 10 training points. How do you get the training hours? Well, like if, if I go to uh, if I go to radar class, 40 hour class, I'll get 10 training points for that rate for that uh, for that training. And so there's an accumulation of, of report and uh, points. It depends on your experience. It depends on your um, your degree. And then those points also add to, um, for example, like I, when I first came to North Carolina, I had enough experience in education and training points to get my advanced degree, my advanced certificate within the first year. Mm -hmm. So it just depends on, on how many classes you attend. If you attend a radar class, you're going to get 10 points. If you attend SFST, which is field sobriety test, you'll get 10 points. Okay. And, and uh, CIT training, that's worth 10 points. And of course, those classes that I just mentioned are classes that we uh, require our patrol officers to have initially um, as quickly as they can as soon as they're off their training cycle. Okay. I have one more question. Yes, now, in the perfect world, this sounds very linear, and someone can easily say, I'm going to go for it. But sometimes things in a person's life that you've had not calculated for, it can be in a sundry of things. 
you've had a parent who has a sudden illness that now you have to move that parent in your house. You may have a special needs child that's born. You may have factors that's beyond your control that has now entered into your life that might prevent you being a PO1 that may have hit you as a P your second year as a PO1 which now you don't have the extra time to move on that linear process. So three years later, you find yourself capped, not because you did not have the initiative, but there were things that happened in your life that was beyond your control. What do we do with those employees? Well, that means the same for every employee that we deal with. I mean, we send, we send everyone to one school per year. That's mm -hmm. 40 hours of training. Then there's the in-service training. And then there's other training opportunities that we have from time to time. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, right now we're doing an SFST class at our, uh, at our police department. So it gives us a little bit more opportunity to get a little bit more, a, a lot more folks in than if we were sending them to say Wilmington and having to pay per diem or, or uh, Raleigh or wherever it might be. So we have those opportunities and of course, you know, that's the idea behind the COPS program so that you can kind of work on that. And those college classes can also be used for training points as well, especially when we're talking about the math course that I just spoke of or the, the report writing course that I just spoke of. You take report writing course, you get the training points for, the, for your advanced certificate, but you also get train, uh, uh, a, a degree or, or credit hours towards your degree. So there's ways that we can work with those folks. And, you know, obviously we've worked uh, very hard to make sure that there's opportunities for all our folks to get their advanced degrees. And we encourage that. And of course, that's part of our promotional process as well. Mayor, this might be a good place to just uh, take a few minute break and then we can come back. Is that acceptable? Yes, sir. Let's and go we'll ahead finish and finish uh, up this part of we'll the discussion. We'll One quick question. How many personnel does this impact? I think, uh, I believe it's 121 of the 133. I, well, I, I, no, I, I think it's 98. I think it's 98. 98. I think it's 98. But you have 130 sworn. Yeah. We'll get the actual number. Uh, but I believe it's a, it's 98. Mm -hmm. But I have to I have to add those up. All right. We're, we're going to recess now. Thank you. Appreciate it.
Okay, we're back in session. Barbara Woodruff, continue. This was the slide where we showed you the cost of implementing the STEP plan. Uh, during the break, uh, the chief did quantify that there are 99 of the 134 officers that this would impact. Uh, let's look at some, what I'll call some, some summary numbers. Now, some of these, uh, you know, we asked a while ago, if you did a 1.5% cost of living increase for everyone, you can see in the middle column what that cost would be. If you did a 1.5% and also adopted the step plan for police where they don't qualify for the cost of living, then the cost of living adjustment for the general fund goes down from 334 down to 270. And in simple math, that's roughly $64,000. It would go down. The step plan, if you adopted it, does require annual maintenance because people will move through the steps. That's estimated at $84,000. I'm sorry, $87,000. And if you notice, if you were the same year, if council gave a 1% increase and you didn't have the step plan, those same employees would cost you 36000 Or if you didn't have the step plan, a 2% increase would cost you 72000 So you can see that the maintenance of the step plan is not overly expensive, but it is more expensive than the cost of living because you're guaranteeing specific $500 steps or $1,000 steps. Let's look at the impact on the, on the fund reserve. We've already said to you, base budget, health premiums, department issues approved thus far roughly 900000 If you approve the step plan, then you're actually committing roughly $1.4 of your general fund balance. And if you did the other suggestions, which we've discussed, approved thus far, roughly 900,000, a cost of living of 333, a fund adjustment of 300, a pay scale of 500,000 for the police, you're now up to $2 million out of your fund reserve. How does that compare, though, to what you've spent in the past in your fund reserve? I would remind you again, here are the numbers that show from 012 to 017, you've generally spent somewhere in the vicinity of $2 million or more of your fund reserve. So what I'm showing you is it's not necessarily out of line if you do all the things that we just recommended. It doesn't mean you have to. I'm just giving you a relativity that you're not stepping out of the normal routine of balancing the budget by spending somewhere in the vicinity of $2 million for the fund reserve. Those are things that we want you to think about. I'm not asking you to make those decisions tonight. I would like to have some direction on those things. Uh, what we can do is go on to the next series of things to update you on street paving while you're thinking of the others. Yes, sir. Oh, he had a question. Uh, I do, too. Cost of living. Yes, sir. What do you have that 1.5? Yes, sir. Where are we? Well, I, I guess that my question is, I think on also is 2.1 based on the southeast region. I forget the time period, but uh, why the variance? Because remember, my recommendation is 1.5 plus the adjustment pool. Now, if you don't want the adjustment pool and you want to simply have a cost of living <coughs> that goes to all employees, okay. then you I might understand. consider a higher number. So you think you may end up around 2% overall or something? Probably 2% overall, but maybe even as high as 3%. Like Yes, you're, you're right, because okay. it's 300,000 plus 333. Would you go back two steps that's, that's there fine. just for, just, I had a thought. To the, one more back. One I more think. back. One more. One more back. Well, I guess like one more. Okay. <laughs> this thing. Okay. 
So this envisions no promotion. No, this does actually, this assumes that people will move through from PO1 to PO2 to PO3. And what we actually did, that's why it cost you $87,000 to maintain it each year. But remember, you're not giving them a cost of living increase. Oh, so the 87 does anticipate people moving from mm -hmm. two to three. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I mean, okay. so it's not just a straight, but, but well, right. I mean, it's it's 98 people, and you're talking about 1,000 or 500 a year, but so that's pretty close. Yeah, but remember, some people only get a $500 increase a year. Right. Some will get a $1,000 increase a year. But so, I was just wondering about the person that's going to get a, a 4000 because they go from the third year of one to the first year of 38 to 42. Yeah. So but that's, that's factored into It is two. factored into okay. that. Okay, it's just not the straight steps, it's the Correct. leaps as well. Correct. Okay. okay. Did you have what a question? What are we going to do? me? No. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. I thought you had a question. Oh, no, 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 I'm good. <laughs> What's the decision time on this? The decision time is any time between now and June the 30th. I mean, y'all, there comes a point where we have to know what your thinking is. While you're if I may use the old term, cogitating on these things, I'd like to show you just a couple of other things that I think are important as you make your final decisions. And let's go now to street paving. As you know, we get roughly 1.7 million in Powell Bill. And roughly half of that, we wind up paving streets. You have 155 miles, Currently, we're paving anywhere three to four miles. We discussed options at one of our meetings. If you increase property taxes, which I don't think any of us, any of you want to do, you could, for every cent, you could pave an additional 1.7 miles. The auto tag, we talked about that. You can implement that on your own any time of the year. Property tax can only go now. The auto tag tax, you can implement any, any council meeting. It takes a little while for it to set up, so there's a delay of the revenue. But if you did this at the maximum that, that you can charge, and you can charge $30, but five of that would go to transit. If you do 25 for paving, it will give you about three more miles a year. Mr. Bittner suggested that we look at a local sales tax. So we have done some research on that. A quarter cent yields 2.4 million or about 12 miles of paving. If you add 12 miles to the four miles you're already paving, for simple math, I'm gonna say that's 15 miles. Actually, I know it's more than that, but okay. If you have 155 miles, Every five years, you will have paved half the city streets. So here's what, you know, using Mr. Bittner's uh, suggestion, we've done a lot of thinking from the staff standpoint about this. Here's what we would recommend that you authorize the mayor to write to the legislative delegation and ask for. A local bill referendum of city voters, quarter cent sales tax collected only within the city. It's good for five years. At the end of five years, it automatically rolls off. All proceeds go to paving. What you would then do is ask the legislative delegation to enter a local bill that would have these components in it. If they authorize the bill, you then set up the referendum. You'd have to decide, do you want the referendum as early as this coming November, or do you want it part of the city election a year from now, or a special election, or, or, or. But this is, before you do any of the other things, this is the one that has the potential to actually address your problem. Because in a five-year period, you would generate enough money to pave half your streets. And the other nice thing is it's guaranteed that it rolls off. And the only way that it comes back 
is if you or a future council goes to a new referendum and asks the taxpayer to vote this on. And again, it would be a referendum of the city voters. It's not a countywide tax. It obviously would apply to every business that has to pay sales tax in the city of Jacksonville. And of course, anyone who uses those businesses, whether they're city residents or not, would pay that. And that's why you would generate over $2 million a year. But if you really want to address your street paving program, this is the only one that has an opportunity to make a difference. So the question before you is, is this something you want us to pursue with your delegation or not? Well, you know how I feel. And I, I've been doing an informal survey amongst some friends and associates, and uh, I've yet to find anyone who would not vote for it. We all agree with the principle. As long as it was dedicated to local streets, they'd be for it. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's I think it's a, a good way to do this. Uh, like you say, it's probably the most effective way to get the most of this paving done. And, you know, our streets are in bad shape. I mean, we hear complaints. You as council members hear complaints every day, probably, from someone that wants to talk about how messed up your streets are. Well, we so, got a complaint today about Gum Branch. Right. The only problem is <laughs> this is Gum Branch. <laughs> but we got a lot of city streets that are, are in bad need of improvement. And I have no problem sending a letter to the uh, legislature. What, what direction do you do you want to give? I'm, I'm in part. Uh, to, if the city voters are going to be the ones that make the decision. They're the ones exactly. that say, "Hey, we're we're willing to pay this to to fix our fix our roads." If they it's don't, their option. To, we're not forcing a thing on. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm willing to back uh, the mayor. Sending a uh, request in local bill. Second. Is that your motion? Yes. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 I'm sorry, was there any discussion? I was going to say, the only thing <laughs> I'd point out is I think it might be better to tie it to the local election okay. as opposed to trying to rush it through to mm -hmm. fall oh, yeah. because there's no, we cannot spend money to promote mm -hmm. or right. deny this. Agreed. Agreed. So Agreed. if you had it coinciding with it, yeah. the local election, mm -hmm. then the candidates could have the chance to talk about it and they'll sure. just be, I agree with and you would have, you know, good idea. You know uh, people that vote in our local elections are locally mm -hmm. concerned. Well, I don't disagree with that, but I'd say that it wouldn't be, I don't think it'd be too difficult to get some groups behind this thing to really advertise it for the, for the city in terms of the interests of the city. Oh, I, I Rotary clubs and everybody else could form a citizens and a citizens advisory group. But again, you are right. Yes. The city cannot spend money lobbying for this issue. Right. All we can do is set the framework <clears throat> and then the public has to decide do they support it or not. But we can advertise an informative uh, piece in terms of what it would do. Yes. Carmen, how much does, would it cost us as a city to put something on the ballot apart from the regular city election? It would, there would be a substantial cost to that, right? That's a good question, Mayor. I'll seems, see what I can find out. Seems to me the cost would be incurred if you put it on this November's ballot. That's what I mean. Instead of yeah. you, when you're already right, cycle, you're already in the cycle. You're paying for November 19 already, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So that wouldn't that wouldn't be any additional cost. We will find that answer. I think you are correct. It would be a nominal cost because oh. you're already setting up for the election. Right. I was saying as opposed to this, this current. Yes. If, right. if you do it, what you're suggesting. We're adding this altogether. Yeah. Okay. No. Anyway. Yeah. All right. Any other thoughts on that? Okay. So, okay. Everybody was in favor? Yes. We had, you had a vote. Yes, sir. We took that. Yes. Now, the other part is Obviously, John Carter, your city attorney, the very handsome city attorney of the city, will have to give us very strict guidelines that we will share with you and the public as to what we as a government can and cannot do relative to that referendum. We will follow those strictly. 
The next thing we'd like to share with you is tax rate information. And at this point, I'm really going to turn this over to Gail. So, Ms. Maids, please. This is just a table showing you what the, the values are or the current estimated values are for 19 compared to what they were for FY18. As you can see, everybody's gone up a little bit, some more significantly than others. <coughs> now, our current tax rate is 0.642 for every $100 of valuation. The revenue neutral, assuming the estimate that we got from the county, is 64.68 cents per 100 of valuation. That's an increase of 0.48 cents, about a half a penny. Um, these things are important because they all, I can see you got a question. <laughs> <Don't answer it. laughs> if you have more value to tax, why is your rate going up as well? Because historical growth over the last three years has been one point one seven I believe percent and our tax value changed something less than that I know it doesn't make any sense but the valuation of the property that made up that growth went down so with the revenue neutral you're allowed to assume that you're acquiring more properties that are not taxed now at the same rate you were the last three years if that makes any sense. You're allowed to assume that your growth would be 1.17 again this year. And that's revenue neutral. It is not exactly the same dollar. Yeah. Okay. Definition game. Right. Yes. But that's, but <laughs> and that's, it's, it's defined in the statute. That's what state, state defined. <laughs> and the six point 64.68 assumes that there are no more changes in the valuation that are significant. Um, the tax assessor has estimated what those changes will be. I think I told you before there are three more cases to go to equalization and review this week. Um, but he's anticipated what he thinks those will be in the numbers he gave us. Now, property tax affects our sales tax. Our property tax levy is the property tax value times the tax rate. Then the distribution percentage is Jacksonville's levy divided by the total of all levies in the county. That will be the county and each of the municipalities, including Jacksonville. So it's our percentage of the total levies in the, in the county. So if you think about that for a minute, anybody's movement in property tax value and in tax rate affects everybody's percentage of sales tax. It's, it's a lot of moving parts. So, just looking at our change and everybody else's change in tax value, property value, and assuming that nobody makes any changes in their rates, we could lose $158,000 in a year. And that's because of the growth in the county. And like, like she says, that's property values only. Okay. And for timing's sake, the property tax levy affects sales, dist sales tax distribution beginning nine months later. So the tax distribution will be affected for the March sales. So it would affect three months of this current, this year we're budgeting for now, and then nine months of the next year. So decisions that are made about the tax rate <coughs> right now will only affect 19 for three months, but it will affect 20's budget for nine months. So, so the next slide. Interesting. <laughs> Okay, so one cent change by Onslow County, and that's just one cent change by Onslow County, produces a loss of about $100,000 in sales tax 
assuming everything else stays the same. That will be $25,000 in FY19 and $75,000 in 20. Now we've all read that the county is talking about a three cent tax increase. That will be a 300,000. That would be in addition to the 158,000 you said that we would lose right off the top. Yes, sir. That's this slide. In FY19, if they raise their rate one cent, we would lose 25,000 for that and then a fourth of the 158,000, so a total of 64,000. And if they raise it three cents, it's 114,500. And then, of course, in the 20 budget, if everything else stayed the same, because we know valuation, we won't have reval, you could be looking at, on the three cents, you could be looking at $458,000 of impact on your sales tax. Mm. Mm. You know, For fiscal year 2020. 20. In fiscal year 20. Now, the good news is that's our last slide. <laughs> 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 yeah. Here's what, um, oh, 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 oh. well, we've said it before and we'll need to say it again. The property tax formula for distribution is so unfair. It rewards people for raising taxes. Yeah. And what makes those others suffer. Plus it rewards the wealthier communities. Yeah. So I see that as an equity problem. You have addressed many of the issues that we discussed tonight. Uh, my memory says that we have now uh, direction regarding water and sewer rates. My memory says that uh, you have also addressed the issue of the uh, positions. Thing to get out the agenda. Uh, You've received information on the fund balance. You've made no decisions on the general compensation nor the recommendations that I had in there relative to certain parts. You have agreed on the three markets that I suggested. I believe that you agreed on the scale movement. Is that correct, Carmen? I don't know that we've talked really about the scale movement. Okay, maybe you didn't do that. So the things that are still left to ad address then, well, let me go on down the, the way. Street paving, we've gotten direction on what we want to do there. So the topics still to decide are the, the things in general compensation as to scale movement, what type of cost of living, do you want to adopt a JPD uh, scale plan, and then eventually we have to get down to final tax number, which would be dependent on how much fund reserve. So uh, those are items that we can continue to discuss tonight or we can meet one week from now on the 12th. Hopefully Mr. Lozera will be present and we can try to finalize those issues. But according to our count, those are the only things left for us to discuss. Are there items that you remember that we don't? Yes. I want to come back in a week and discuss it further. We can, although I'm I'm ready to discuss the pay, the uh, police department, but so, but, so I, but I'm willing to wait, you know, either so way. Whatever the pleasure is of the council. Well, one thing about the police, I uh, there'd be some who might argue that it doesn't go far enough, but I think it goes right it goes as, as much as we can afford to do, and it's a good it's move. A yeah. I agree. Put it out there. Is it a motion? You gonna make it? I'll make that a motion that we approve the compensation plan for the police department. I'll second okay. that. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Further discussion. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All aye. Aye. That solves that. I think we've got to address. We we've, we've got to address that that talent. You know, leaving leaving us yeah, and yeah. going elsewhere. We've I got to. That's go. important to us. Stop the train. Right. Yeah. 
So you want to consider the general compensation next week? Yeah, because yeah. I think we still had, I still had some, a little concern, you know, but, but um, on the, I uh, forget now what I was concerned about. But, uh, <laughs> well, the impact on the general government. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, 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 on the uh, impact on the scale. Right, moving, moving the scale. It, it really wasn't so much the uh, you know, cost of living or anything, it was really the messing with the scale a little bit. Although I'm I'm fine with uh, with the hybrid, I think we've already settled that um, on the market. But. So if we did that, we wouldn't have a meeting next week. I think we I think we would have a meeting next week, right? Is that what we're saying? Yeah, uh, yes. Well, the the issue, yeah. the only issues left then are, what are you going to do with the general employee compensation issues, and are you and that really has three parts. Are you going to move the scale? Are you going to give an across the board? And are you going to set up the adjustment pool? Those are the only issues left then. Well, no, and also, do we move the scale also on, a, on an annual basis? Correct. Yes, sir. So we're coming back next Tuesday. Well, we, you late today, we did something that, um, we normally don't do we and and maybe we should be doing this on a regular basis it's not a bad idea we normally you normally don't see workshop slides until you get here which sometimes puts you at a disadvantage we were working on these slides proofing numbers i mean literally up until three o'clock this afternoon so we forwarded this entire program to you what we will do is we will you obviously have that but we will skinny this down now just to those issues that are left on compensation and resend those to you in the morning. That way you can see all, anything about the general fund balance, anything having to do with the general fund balance or the pay, that will be the skinny down version so you can really concentrate on that. Because what you have to get comfortable with is the bottom line of how much of your fund reserve are you comfortable spending? Or obligating. Whatever, yes, sir. Whatever you want us to call it. I got a question before we before we leave tonight. Going back to that whole thing on the general compensation uh, <clears throat> and doing that, doing the comparison that, that you suggest, that you have recommended us to do. At what point are we going to do that study to to determine where we, those changes need to be made or how those positions are going to be looked at as far as well. If you gave us a, a direction on June the 12th, next week, that that's what you want us, wanted us to do, then we as a staff would begin immediately to work through every one of those because what you will do is literally print out every employee, literally every employee other than police because you've now taken the police department significantly out of that program. And we would begin to do the analysis of where they fall and who actually needs adjustment. That will take weeks and weeks of analysis because it really isn't a computer program where you just simply plug in There's this times 3%. Market. There's markets that we've identified. Well, what you're really going to do is not really in, in that is you're not so much looking at the market as you're looking at internal equity. And... Uh, you know, the concept there was uh, that, that we would do that administratively. We can certainly bring it back for you to bless. The problem is that normally you don't get involved in blessing individual pay. You don't want to get into that. that. No. no, but I, but I think that would be a good time to, when you're, when you're addressing the, the compression and what you think are perhaps underpaid, and that's, that's an opportunity to evaluate the markets that, oh, you, yes. that you've identified. And, and, and I see that as taken at least till October. Um, and, and, you know, uh, Angela and I were talking, uh, you know, when you do something like this, we don't want to be the council should not and, and probably do not want to be involved in all the micro decisions that have to be made. We, we expect the, the city's man, upper management staff to, to make the decisions, and we, I think we all have confidence in, in, uh, in y'all's leadership in doing that sort of thing. So. Thank you. I agree. 
Five o'clock next Tuesday. Let me uh, suggest that uh, since we're going to have a rather light agenda, that we include a personnel session for the evaluation or discuss the evaluation of our two employees. I think that'd be a good opportunity with a light agenda. So, everybody, all right with that? Ready? Okay. Thank you all very much for your time tonight. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? All right.